ionic compounds. So recall that a compound is made up of more than one type of element. If you just have one element, uh, it's called an element. If you combine more than one type of element, though, you can get a compound. If those elements, when they combine, they exchange electrons, and so one of them loses electrons, the other one gains electrons, we know that ions are going to end up being formed. If those ions form a solid crystal, we call it ionic compound. Now, I suppose you, you could have a really high temperature and you could have a liquid ionic compound. It doesn't necessarily have to be a solid, um, but for all the ones we're going to see, they are going to be solids. Formula units are a concept we use to describe ionic compounds. And really understanding what a formula unit is, is necessary to understand what an ionic compound is. So the formula of an ionic compound is a ratio, and that's the key term there, is a ratio of its ions. And we call this ratio, we put it down to the simplest whole numbers, and we call this ratio a formula unit. And again, that's the key point about ionic compounds, is that when we're talking about them, we use their, their, their chemical formula. That is a formula unit. So for example, sodium chloride common table salt we know has the um, chemical formula NaCl. The formula unit for sodium chloride is NaCl. Now it is really, really important to understand that this is not saying that sodium chloride is made up of one sodium atom and one chlorine atom. That is incorrect. That's the common misunderstanding with ionic compounds. So people would think, oh, sodium chloride, the formula definitely is NaCl. And so they'd think, okay, it must have one sodium and one chlorine atom. But that is incorrect. That's the wrong way to think about ionic compounds. That is not how ionic compounds are. That's not how sodium chloride is. Instead, what you need to think about is you need to consider that this formula is the lowest whole number ratio. It is a ratio of one sodium which is an ion, not an atom, an ion, to one chloride ion. That is the lowest whole number ratio. That's not saying there's one of them. That's saying for every one sodium there is, there is one chloride. So think of it as one gazillion sodium ions, however much that is, a whole bunch, but there, whatever amount there is of sodium ions, there is an equal amount in this case because it's a one to one ratio. There's also going to be, if there's one gazillion sodium ions, there will also be one gazillion chloride ions. That is the key to understanding how ionic compounds actually are. So when you go to picture them, do not picture them as um, their formula would make you think you should be picturing them. Instead, picture them as they actually are, as this ionic crystal where you have a particular ratio, whatever it happens to be, whatever the formula tells you it is. For sodium chloride, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's how you want to think of them. There is a, a certain amount of sodium ions and a certain amount of chloride ions that are equal to each other, and it is a whole bunch of them. So really, when you see the formula, you should think, okay, there is sodium ions. Notice that the formula doesn't have charges in it, but they are there, so remember that they're there. And then think of a little subscript N denoting some number. And then there is chloride ions also present in the same number as sodium ions. So that's really how you should be thinking of the formula for any ionic compound. They are charged and the ratio of them is denoted by how many there happen to be, leaving you to think of them as having a, a giant three-dimensional, it doesn't look like a cube, three-dimensional crystal structure. Um, lots and lots and lots of those ions in a particular whole number ratio. So the properties of these ionic compounds are going to be based on the fact that they are in these crystal lattice structures. Um, lattice means repeating units, so they're in this three-dimensional crystal lattice repeating unit structure, and then all of their properties are going to be based on that. That's why it's so important to understand how they actually are. They do not look like little molecules. They are these big repeating patterns of ions. So each ion is going to be surrounded by many oppositely charged ions. So for example, we can see in this one here, we have a sodium ion and, um, sorry, sodium ion here, 
and a chloride ion there, sodium with a positive charge, chloride ion with a negative charge. And it's not just one sodium and one chloride ion. Um, and this is a, a one to one ratio here. So we have lots of sodium ions, lots of chloride ions, they're just present in a one to one ratio. But if you looked at this chloride ion here, we'd see that, um, let's get this a little bit easier to see, it is surrounded by a number of different positively charged ions. Plus there's one behind it and there's one in front of it, right? Um, so this one negative ion has six positive ions surrounding it. And again, that, that is how you understand the properties of ionic compounds is you think of them as repeating crystals, these three-dimensional um, particular, uh, particular ratio of ions in this three-dimensional pattern as a crystal lattice structure. So this leads them to have a high melting point. Remember, melting is essentially being able to get the particles to move around relative to each other. So if they're frozen as a solid, they're fixed. And then when you melt them, they become free so they can actually move relative to the other particles around them. In an ionic crystal, though, if you imagine like this sodium here, again, it's, it's surrounded by these chloride ions. And this is just a two-dimensional slice of the crystal. There, there's, there's another plane in front of it and behind it as well. And so they're, they're, they're held in place really, really well by those oppositely charged particles. So this attraction makes it hard to free these ions, and therefore it's really hard to melt ionic crystals. Same property, um, there's same, same, same cause for this particular property. They are known to be quite hard. Not the same thing as strong. Don't don't confuse those as the same thing. Strength is a is a another type of thing. Think in terms of hardness as the ability to scratch them. And so ionic crystals are really hard to to scratch. If you tried scratching an ionic crystal, you'd be trying to move the ions away from their relative position. And again, they're surrounded by obsolete charged particles, large obsolete charged ions. So doing that is going to be difficult, and therefore ionic crystals end up being quite hard. And just make sure in your head you're thinking that's not strong, that means hard to scratch. As hard as they are to scratch, they are also brittle. And that's why you, you don't want to think of them as being strong. You want to think of them as being hard to scratch, but they are also brittle. Because if you do happen to move the ions, it takes a bit of force, but if you do happen to do it, the spot where they want to be, they're no longer in. So for example, if you, if you imagine this crystal here, um, I think, I don't know, the red ones are positive, imagine, and then the blue ones are negative. So everyone's happy in this arrangement here. You've got a positive surrounded by negatives. Everything's great. Um, but if you then to move some of these ions over a little bit, just move them over the, the, the space of one atom, which is not much at all, then you end up with these positively charged ions being next to other positively charged ions, and that is going to cause them, they're, they're the same charge, that's gonna cause them to repel each other. And therefore, the crystal will actually break apart, and that's what it means to be brittle. A lot of ionic compounds are going to be soluble in water. Now, there's, there's lots of exceptions, but uh, the general trend is that ionic compounds tend to be soluble in water. The ions themselves have charges, and water also has charges to it. They're not ionic charges. They are partial charges. So we, we, we label them slightly different, but they are charges. And so, therefore, the charged water molecules are going to be attracted to the ions and the ions to the charged water molecules and therefore the water is able to actually get in and break up the structure um, fairly easily because of that opposite attraction of charges. Conductivity with these ones, if the ions are free to move and remember the, the, the way to do that would be by melting them which would be really difficult or easier to do. You could get a charged substance to get in there and start pulling the crystals apart one ion at a time um, by dissolving them in water. Either way, melting or dissolve, the ions would be free to move. And as long as they're free to move, they will be able to move a electrons from one place to another, um, carry a current, which is known as being conductive. This does not work when they're solid. So when they're solid, remember, they're stuck in their, their positions. They can't move very easily. Um, so, so they do not conduct electricity as a solid. But if you put them in water, the ions are able to move around. We're able to get electrons from one place to another. They will be conductive. Or if you were to melt them, very difficult to do, but they would also be conductive if you melted them. Now, in terms of ionic bonding, um, we can look at how these ions are going to be coming together based on how many electrons the atoms that make up these ionic compounds, how many electrons these atoms want to gain or lose. 
So recall, atoms are going to gain or lose electrons because that is the way in which they become stable. They can gain a full outer shell, become isoelectronic with their nearest noble gas. This is what they're trying to do to become stable. This is their goal in life. The ratio in which these ion compounds are made, so again, sodium chloride is a one-to-one -one ratio of sodium to chlorine, but if you had magnesium chloride, it would be a one to two ratio. So what determines this ratio is depending on who's making them up, how many electrons they want to lose or gain. So we can see how this works um, by using our Lewis dot diagrams to essentially make track the electrons um, and, and where they go from one atom to the other. So if we try this first with lithium, let's do a lithium a little bit darker there, lithium. Um, and so if we were to draw a Lewis dot diagram, it's got three electrons total. It's got two in the inner shell and one in the outer shell, one valence electron. So when we do a Lewis dot diagram, we only draw that one electron. And then if we have a chlorine atom, we've got a total of seven valence electrons that we've got to put on here. And so there is our Lewis dot diagram for chlorine. So in order to become stable, what lithium is going to want to do is transfer its one electron over to chlorine. So if lithium and chlorine were to react and do realize that we're talking a chlorine atom here, the name for chlorine gas is also called chlorine, confusingly enough. Um, so in this case, we are not looking at a chlorine molecule. We are just looking at a single atom of chlorine. So here is lithium. And if it loses its one electron, it would then have the next shell down. The inner shell would be full. Uh, if chlorine gains that one electron, it would then have eight in its outer shell. That would be a full outer shell. So they'll do that. And then our lithium becomes an ion. So when we're doing Lewis dot diagrams, we want to put it in square brackets. And we can put one plus or just plus. That's good too. And our chloride, let's stick with the same colors. Our chloride is now an ion as well. So I'm going to draw in its original electrons and I'll throw in a different color to show the difference between them. Uh, if you can see that, maybe a bit darker. No, I can't see that very well at all. Um, either way, it is going to have a charge of one negative though. Just to clarify, these electrons belong to the original diagram. So to show the bonding with an ionic compound, you essentially have to do that in two steps. You'd say, okay, here's the original setup with the um, atoms as they are, and then here is how they end up after they have transferred their electrons. So this ends up with one lithium to one chlorine, and so our formula for lithium chloride is LiCl, one lithium, one chlorine. Now realize this is not a, a, a group of two though, right? This is happening, so what we really mean is one gazillion lithium ions and one gazillion chloride ions are gonna combine in a crystal, and that's how we get lithium chloride. All right, slightly harder, magnesium, again, two valence electrons, it's in column number two. And then we have chlorine over in column number seven again, so it has seven valence electrons. And in this case here, um, magnesium can transfer one electron to chlorine, and then chlorine's happy, right? It, it's not going to take any more because it only wants eight, that's it, that's it for a full shell. So magnesium though is, is not happy, it hasn't gotten rid of both of its electrons. So you're gonna to need to have another chlorine atom involved to get magnesium to become stable. So magnesium wants to lose two electrons, chlorine only wants to gain one, therefore you need two chlorines. So then you would end up with your magnesium ion with a charge of two plus, it has lost two electrons. And then your chloride ion, it has gained an electron. I'm gonna draw this one in blue so we can actually see it this time. Put it in square brackets. It has a charge of negative one, but there are two of them. So if you'd like, you can write that out twice. So you know there's two of something by drawing it twice. Um, chemistry, we get kind of lazy and we say, well, I don't wanna write that, that twice. I'm just gonna put a two in front of it and a, a, a large, Number two in front of a symbol tells you that there is two of them, um, not necessarily connected together. So you can draw both of them separated out, or you can put this large full-size number in front of the ion to say that there are two of them. If you put a two underneath, 
that's a subscript, we use that to say something else. We say that's when they're connected to each other. In this case, there's just two of them, so we just put a large number two in front. All right, with this last example, we have aluminum, and it is in column 13. So it has three valence electrons around it, and we are combining it with the oxygen here. One, actually, that's the proper order. Two, three, four, five, six. So in terms of transferring, aluminum can transfer one, two over to oxygen. And, and now this oxygen has eight. It's happy. It's done. But aluminum's not. It, it's got one more to do, one more to transfer. So we're going to need another oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that aluminum can then transfer its electron there. And now it's happy. Great. But this second oxygen's not happy. So we got to have another aluminum. And it is the same as the first one. It's got three valence electrons. Um, and it can transfer its one of its electrons, oh, there we go, to that oxygen. And now this oxygen's got eight, it's happy. But this aluminum, the second aluminum's not happy, so we need another oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six, because it's my column 16. And now this aluminum can transfer its two electrons to that oxygen. This oxygen's happy, that aluminum's happy. And this is why aluminum oxide is found in a ratio of two aluminum ions each one has lost three electrons so it has a charge of three plus and three oxygen let's draw in their lewis structures here each oxygen has gained two electrons so their charge is negative two so you find aluminum oxide in a ratio of two aluminum ions to every three oxygen ions now I realize the formula for aluminum oxide we would write it as a subscript a little bit easier to read so we would say there are three aluminums and two oxygen so did that wrong two aluminums and three oxygens and this is the formula for aluminum oxide we can see these are the two aluminum ions and these are the three oxide ions the name changes to ide uh, for the negatively charged anion um, so this is aluminum oxide two aluminums three oxide ions and again it's not saying that that's all there is it's saying that this is made up of a giant three-dimensional crystal and in there there's a ratio of two aluminums to three oxygens but it's like two gazillion aluminums each one with a charge of plus three and three gazillion oxide ions each one with a charge of negative two so key takeaway, make sure you're thinking of ions correctly. Think of them as this crystal lattice structure, huge, huge numbers of ions. The formula does not tell you how many there are. It tells you the ratio of the ions present in that ionic compound.